Anand Shah is a senior vice president with Albright Stonebridge Group's India and South Asia practice, where he helps clients manage both short-term challenges and long-term growth opportunities. Before joining ASG, he led global strategy for new ventures at the BMW Group and was advisor and manager at Audi AG in the social innovation department. He founded a number of enterprises and nonprofits, including Sara Vajal, a technology and market-based provider of clean water to rural villages and urban settlements in India. Teach for India and Indicorps, a nonprofit that connects the Indian diaspora with opportunities to contribute to India's development. He serves as a TED Fellow, which means he's got ideas worth sharing, and an Aspen Institute Global Leadership Network Fellow. He holds a BA from Harvard and studied science, ethics, and society at the Cal Institute of Technology. And what we're going to do is what we did earlier. If you've got questions, we've got mics on either side. So we're going to be very, very orderly and line up instead of running around the room because we want to make sure that everyone can ask questions about this crazy uh, future that we're all walking into together. Let's give a big hand for Anand Shah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the kind intro and thank you for having me uh, and giving me an opportunity to organize my ideas worth sharing for a few moments. 60 years ago, almost to the day, about a month off, a satellite called Sputnik hit space in 1957. And in response, the United States put up a statement saying, we needed to be an initiator, not the victim of technological surprises. And that gave rise to something that's now known as DARPA. We set up DARPA as a statement of how this country would be a leader in technology. It gave rise to what we now call the space race. And the reason I bring this up is because the space race wasn't just about getting satellites into space. It was about microwaves and the internet and drones and autonomous self-driving cars and smartphones. All of these things came out of an attempt for us to be leaders at what was seen as the most technologically difficult challenge of our time. It also rallied a country of innovators to continue to be innovators around the world. As we've imagined these things in pop culture, we've seen many stories of what this so-called future of being a technological initiator looks like, whether it's the Jetsons or the Terminator or Star Wars or Ex Machina or The Martian. All of these involve visions of how technology can change the way we live and visions of how technology might make our lives better and make the world more fascinating. At some level, they're also a premonition. And the reason I say that is because I think we're in the midst of what could be called a new space race. It is a derivative of the original one. And we're calling that artificial intelligence for the nature of the conversation we're having here. Artificial intelligence, to me, is a technology looking for an application. It is something we've talked about. It's something we've played with, from Tamaguchi eggs to Ido the robot dog in the 1980s being relaunched today. It's something we contribute to as users of Google Maps or Alexa or any of these things. We're helping train technology that can think like us or better than us. It's a fascination, it's an OCD kind of compulsion to believe that this is something that we can do and perhaps therefore should do. And I think that's the question at the crux of policy and world affairs in my view around artificial intelligence. As an example of 
what artificial intelligence means and why suddenly this technology now is beginning to find an application. I'm going to talk about something I know a lot about, which is autonomous cars. And I want to break down where this whole idea of self-driving cars came from. In a country where we believe our love affair with vehicles and the desire to drive is something that we'll never let go of. And the first is because the car at some level, from a dispassionate view, is a ridiculous entity today. And what I mean by that is, in America, the car is used for 3.8% of time. 96.2% of the time, it is sitting around, in your garage, in a parking lot, in the parking garage under this hotel, on the sides of streets that we have to build so that cars can get there in the driveways into a hotel that need to exist so that people can get in the car. It is the most over-engineered, underutilized machine in the history of mankind. If you had a $100,000 sewing machine, you would be using it all the time. <laughs> but in a car, we don't. And the reason for that is because we need it for the way that our society has evolved since it was invented. We also spend a lot of money on the car partially for vanity or for uh, some sort of status, but also because it is how we get to work and how we do things in life. In the middle of America, a car payment plus its costs around oil changes and fuel can rival the payment for your home. Not so true on the coast. <laughs> Recently, we've seen a lot of changed consumer attitudes. This idea that people want to drive and want to own a car is being challenged by changing behavior. If you drive in Washington, D.C. at rush hour, and I'm sure this is true of many other cities, most people behind the wheel don't want to be driving. And the way you see that is to look around and watch them look at their phones, right, as they're texting or watching a video or listening to a podcast. Many young people today will tell you that they don't need a car. In fact, they don't want one. You know, Uber or Lyft will take me to my friends, it gives me the freedom that I need, and I don't have to deal with parking or oil changes or learn how to change a flat tire or worry about insurance or any of the other things that, you know, a car needs. It's all built into that movement. And people are buying that, right, in large numbers. Whether they're making money or not is a different story. But the idea around the world, one of the fastest growing technology businesses we've seen have been in the idea of simply getting people to sit in the back seat of a car rather than the front seat of a car. And this change is really profound. And what I want to help you understand of why the autonomous car went from being a fascination that DARPA started and Google decided to take on for a while as a random experiment of one of the founders is because if you want to grow a company like Uber or Lyft or Ola or Grab Taxi, you need drivers. The simple supply of being able to provide that service is vehicles that are available to give people a ride. The quirks of those vehicles happen to be the driver. Right? Whether they want to work right now, they don't want to work, they want to go this far, they keep their car clean, you know, all of these things. Whether they want to talk to you a lot, not talk to you a lot. Like the, the issues of the car taking you somewhere happens to be the driver. And if you want to compete with that and you want lots of drivers, the best answer to having to deal with millions of human beings as drivers is to have a robot that knows how to drive. And you can train it. And so now if I want to compete with Uber tomorrow, I can take all these robotic cars and dump them in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and suddenly when you hit a button for a ride, a car is available. And it doesn't have an attitude. So this is an application. It's an application that requires a device, a robot, to understand simple, basic things that, frankly, we don't want to do anymore, like keep your eyes on the road. And this is what makes artificial intelligence, all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, something that we seem to be talking about in great numbers. The car industry is 10 million jobs in America. It's $2 trillion. That's not just cars being manufactured or people driving. It's oil changes. It's extra parts. It's people that want to paint flames on the side of their car, all of that, right? It's also parking. It's also 40% of space in a city like New York that is dedicated to parking so that, you know, that we can have our cars to get somewhere where it's going to sit around for 10 hours. 
And so suddenly people say, well, oh, I can rearrange all of this. I can make it so that the trillions of dollars spent on these assets that sit around right, can become money in our pockets, make it more efficient, make it for the person who goes to work to build a car in Detroit can start spending 90% less on their travel, even though they may not have a job anymore. Right? And so the, the fact is that the benefit of this improvement also goes to the people who are affected by it. And this is giving a rise to something that I would call political consumerism. Right? It is the benefits accruing to us as individuals speaking in a way that is not being kept up with by policy. And I'll give you an example again in the car industry for this. Right? The original taxi policies, whether they were in New York or other cities, were a simple idea. Right? I, find someone that I license that you trust, we make sure the car is inspected, we give it the permission to put a light on top of it or paint it yellow, and it's allowed to pick people up you know, on the street wherever it wants. As it evolved, it became a limitation. There weren't enough cars. If I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was no such thing as a taxi. I had my friend take me to the airport, or I called Super Shuttle and waited for four hours. And suddenly, you, know, you have this new thing around people riding in the back seat of a car, driving another car, that has completely upended the policy regime around this, and no one knows what to do about it. Right? Now, if I were an innovator, I'd say, OK, what else can I do with that? And in this case, it's, I can disrupt this entire fleet of vehicles that sit around you know, in the sun by building a robot that knows how to drive, that moves that vehicle 96% of the time rather than 3% of the time and delivers everything everybody what they want, it helps city you know, policy makers have more space and build low income housing and build parks and it helps the guys going to work spend a lot less money on their cars so they can spend it on education or smartphones. Right? They, it, helps, it helps people who uh, like their time and don't want to spend two hours of it driving to be able to sit in the back of the car and have a conversation with their grandmother. Right? It is something that everyone along the chain likes except perhaps to some extent, the person who gets most affected by it in terms of work. Now, if you think of other things like this that are sleepy from a personal experience, right? going to the doctor is one of them. Right? I gotta take time off of work, I gotta get to the doctor, I gotta sign off all these paperwork, like, you know, I'm not sure the doctor knows what he's talking about, sometimes I need a second opinion. That would be cool if it was automated. Maybe my iPhone 20 will let me put my finger up to it and tell me what's wrong with me and then a drone delivers some medicines to my house. Sounds crazy, but it's convenient, right? And this is what is driving these changes now, right? We want smartphones because they make our lives better as consumers, right? We want cars that we can ride in because I don't have to spend 30 minutes looking for parking. We want robots that tell me that I'm a doc, you know, that what's wrong with me so I don't have to deal with the inconvenience of my time being spent by this, right? The same is becoming true in other things like agriculture. In India, farmers, and their children of farmers don't want to be farmers anymore. Right? This is a real problem. It's 50% of jobs in India. You know? But in a small holding farm, you can have robots to tell you what ingredients to give it. And you know, all these things are making my life better as a farmer so I can spend time on other things. But eventually, I ask the question of like, why am I putting the seed in the ground myself? Someone else can do that. A robot can do that too. Right? And the art is being taken away by what is eventually becoming artificially intelligent things that are being propagated because we want a more convenient life. In my previous job, I worked for a premium car company. It used to be that premium in the days of the 1960s, 70s, 80s when car companies were launching was, was better engineering, comfortable seats, heated seats, heads up displays, you know, bigger tires and wheels and things that cornered well. You want to sit in the back of the car, you don't care so much about what speed it corners at. Right? Premium today, in all things, turns out to be time. Right? What people want is time. They want their own time whether they're going to be disrupted from a job or they want their own time because they have better things to do with it. Right? And what that ultimately ends up meaning is repetitive, mundane things that can be calculated and perhaps better scientifically. Right? perhaps should be done by a robot. And I'll give you a real example of this. A couple of years ago, you might remember, there was a, a, a ter terrible airplane crash in Germany from a plane called German Wings, where the pilot locked the other pilot out of the cockpit and flew the plane intentionally into a mountain. Most of you guys might know that 
that today pilots really just take planes off and land them, but for most of the part of flight, they're being flown by autopilot. And the debate that raged after that for a couple of months was, should the pilot be allowed to fly the plane or not when it's in the air? That's a real question. We would never have thought that 20 years ago. Like, would I fly in a plane where there's nobody flying, you know, it in front of me for, for at 400 miles an hour, 30,000 feet above the sky? But today, I trust the robot more. Right? And at some level, what's happening in the U.S. around autonomous cars is similar. Right? There's 30,000, 35,000 deaths a year, 90% of which on the road, 90% of which are because of human error, because someone's looking at their phone or decide to run a stop sign or want to go faster, you know. And at some level, there's an argument to be made that that maybe shouldn't be allowed anymore, right? In India, that number is 130,000 deaths a year caused by human error, people that don't get glasses or people that are drunk when they're driving, or whatever it might be. And at some level, that's a compelling argument. I get space back in the city. I reduce accidents and safety. The health care costs go down of, of having to deal with, you know, trauma care. Uh, I don't have to spend as much on fire trucks picking people out of their cars after they've banged it up. Like, a, from a policymaker's perspective, I can buy that. So, the question mark for me now is how exactly do we address this, right? As thinkers around the world of what's right, what's not, what should be, could be done. And I'm going to use the car example as an example to launch into a little bit of what I think is, is plausible. Um, so again, the reason autonomous cars and artificial intelligence as an application the cars has taken off is because I need access to drivers. Right? I need access to an asset that can move itself. The challenge in the other side is that lots of people like the job of being a driver for something like an Uber or Lyft because it's flexible. It feeds also my consumer need for my time back. I can drive when I want to, drive another time, I can supplement my income. If I don't want to do it this week, I don't have to. All of these sorts of things. It's a nice little you know, conundrum. The issue there also is that you can solve that problem differently, which is you can help the people willing to drive get access to the opportunity to drive somewhere. Okay? Ultimately, the reason that doesn't happen today is because there's all kinds of middlemen. Those middlemen are, are policies, they're technologies, they're other things. The middlemen could be the taxi commission, the middlemen could be the guys that own Super Shuttle, the middlemen could be whatever, but it's keeping me as a person with a car that knows how to drive from connecting directly with the customer. Right? Now, if this trend is happening, one way of thinking about the labor movement there is to help labor find better access to people who need it whether that is as drivers, or it's as medical professionals, or something along those lines. That also is an opportunity in the same terms as where we started with DARPA, right? which was we would, not be, we would be the initiator, not the victim of strategic technological surprises. Right? That's not just about technology that is cool, that we can talk about, that we can make movies about, but it's also not being surprised by the impacts of that technology on our society and how it operates. Right? That too requires innovation, and it requires policymakers to think about this. So for example, right, one might think that there is a policy role to be played in building a marketplace for labor that connects labor that can create productive value directly to those who need it. In the case of driving, maybe that is a policy facilitated platform that says if you have a car, and you have willingness to drive, and you want to be available, we put you into the cloud, right? and that everybody who's looking for you can find you. These are things we need to think about. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I'm putting it out there. Right? And I think that this can be an opportunity in many other things where we get the convenience and the benefits of something like artificial intelligence, which is, has a really ra wide range of things. Right? It's a, it is pets that are cool that can feel and talk to you that may be better than the real pet. Um, it is lights you can talk to and say, please turn on the light because it's less time than flipping a switch. It is, you know, but it's also things like cars that you don't need to own anymore and you can more conveniently get from place to place and your parents 
who may not be able to drive anymore can get where they need to go and have independence. And your kids who you might have to spend half of your day shuttling around can suddenly get where they need to go so they can be more productive. That is real value. Right? It'll also be true in other industries, whether it's agriculture or it's healthcare or it's other services. So I'd like to end by saying that the big difference in this technological revolution, right? There have been previous ones, previous space races that were largely military industrial complexes. And, and also, to be clear, some of those in, you know, gave rise, the industrial revolution early on gave rise to the differences between haves and have nots and capital and labor and created conflict. At some level, you could make that argument again in the 30s. You can make that argument again with the space race and a cold version of conflict, right? And you can make the argument today that when Japan is saying that you come to the Olympics in 2020, and you'll be shuttled around in a car that drives itself, and China is saying we might completely ban combustion vehicles, go all electric, and we're spending billions of dollars on AI technology, and there are companies, whether it's Baidu or Tencent or Foxconn or building self-driving cars, the US is saying, the rest of you, you're not going to win at this. We are, because we're not going to be technologically surprised, is allowing trucks to drive themselves across Nevada or in Iowa or elsewhere. All great things, potentially. Right? Korea is saying, hey, we've also got technological capability. India, by the way, has said, we're not going to allow autonomous cars at all, because it's going to screw labor. But I don't know if that's going to last. Right? This is the space race. This is countries saying, this is the technology that we have to win at to send a signal to our own people and the people around the world that we are the ones to beat. That we have innovation, we can build it from here. Hey, the thing to recognize, and I think of this if I were to, you know, if I don't like driving, but I like the fact that I can make money driving, maybe I own a robot that drives for me to make money for me. Right? Ultimately, capital wins at that game. Right, at some point, that's going to mean, if you let it go as it is, that it aggregates into one place where it's most efficient. Right? And I just want to raise a flag. I'm not being a, you know, a negative nanny. But raise a flag that there are things we need to think about as this goes forward, as what these technologies allow, don't allow, and what they could give rise to right? in terms of international affairs, in terms of country versus country, in terms of citizens and their well-being in terms of better outcomes for health and education and incomes. Right? But what is clear to me is because of the consumer demand of a better life and more time, right, that it is now of age that this technology in the form of artificial intelligence is something that is coming. And it will be there largely because we at the individual level want it. Maybe not at the collective level, but that's a question we have to address. So I'm going to end with that and say that I think there's a lot to think about here, and I hope that that is thought-provoking enough to have a conversation. So thank you. There's one right back there, but I'll come right back to you. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much for this topic. I'm obsessed with this, and I encourage anybody who wants to hear more to uh, look up the video, Human Needs, Humans Need Not Apply. Uh, if this conversation didn't give you an existential crisis, that video definitely will. Uh, so my question is, do you believe, as some es experts have posited, that we will eventually reach a point when very few people will work, uh, that we're in a new age of technological advancement, different from those in the past, such as that eradicated uh, agriculture jobs, for example, uh, or will we continue to invent new types of work that we can't even fathom right now? Bare minimum, uh, do you think we'll have to accept a higher base level of unemployment, uh, demand more equity for employees in the form of wage policy, or maybe even go so far as universal basic income? I think it's too early to tell, right? I think that the the challenge is that technology is moving faster than we think collectively. And in my view, and I'll give you again a car example of this, the, the pace car for artificial intelligence in the space race is policy. In the absence of policy, 
it'll go on its own way. Right? And an example of that is pretty much every law written about physical space everywhere in the world involves a car. Right? How much you can build on a road depends on how wide the road is, and how wide the road is because of how much throughput it can take, which includes a car parking there half the time. Right? You know, what you can and can't do, where curbs go, don't go, where parks go, don't go, how we deal with people coming in and out of cities, but all that has to do with something in the car. We have to rewrite all of that. Right now, it's not being rewritten, it's just being superseded right, by technology. And I think that a lot, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that we need to go from where we are and believe that no one, you know, Futurama-esque, everyone's going to want to sit in a chair 20 years from now right, and not do anything. That's not necessarily true. People also have to work. They want to work. They want to do productive things. Right? The question is what those productive things are, at what pace, and how. It shouldn't be a foregone conclusion to us now that technology is going to run the inevitable gamut. Because right? it's not inevitable. It never has been. So there was a question here. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the point was that, that quantifying what the impact of this hasn't really been done. And in Colorado Springs, they looked at, they looked at taxes and the taxes that pay for, for you know, police, police that give speeding tickets, that police the streets and make sure we're safe, to taxes are on cars that are sold and uh, an ad infinitum. But, but no one's actually done the work from what I can tell. We've looked for it. I tried to do some of that in an earlier job. You know, but it is a mixed bag because there are benefits also. The amount saved and the amount that you save in, in, or the amount that you might lose is an opportunity cost. The difference though, which I think is also potentially um, attractive to a policymaker, is right now those are a bunch of different taxes, right? I have a gasoline tax, I have this tax, I have that tax. Tomorrow, and so a good example is when you ride an, an Uber or a Lyft, Right? It includes the cost of fuel, it includes the cost of insurance. You just pay by the mile. Right? Theoretically, you could just tax that. Right? So you get one tax that taxes all of it at once. Right? And it still may end up being cheaper. So the efficiency for the policymaker gets fascinating as well. You know, so again, there are different forces pushing in both directions. So, but a good point. Over there, I can't see, there's light, so That's please great. speak. Good morning, yeah. thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Obviously, a lot of people uh, with questions here were inspired by that. I'm an educator, and education tends to be uh, rather slow at reacting to what's going on around the world. Um, so I'm wondering if you specifically have any suggestions you would give that we in education need to make sure our children are aware of, skills or knowledge, that will help them prepare to be global leaders in a field like this. I know it's a, it's a great question, and had I kept going, I would have eventually gotten there. But I think that, uh, you know, there's an existential crisis for the ed education system as a whole, not, not even for the future, even right now, around what skills are appropriate to meet the needs of jobs now. Right? So we have constant conversations around the world of there's so many job openings and nobody can find wor workers for them, and we talk about unemployment, and there's so many people that can't find work. And, Arguably, the answer to that is figuring out how to rebalance education at some level. The, the, the answer that I would give, and I don't have answers, but, but my thoughts on this would be that, you know, I do think education needs to figure out how to be more flexible in the form of giving snippets of skills that are relevant. So an example I've seen in higher education is that, you know, in, there's been a bunch of social enterprise startups lately who are trying to certify people's skills not as a whole, but specifically. And so in software, this person knows JavaScript. They may not be able to write an English paper, but they know JavaScript, right? And that's what's needed for this job, and that's what's being looked at for this job. That's a very philosophical question, but, but arguably certifying that has some value. So I think recognizing that flexibility and um, 
fluidity in the way that we think of what the whole package of education looks like needs to be more responsive to what skills are being demanded by advancements. And that's a question that I'm not involved in, so I don't have an answer, but, but even if I was, I probably wouldn't. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Olivia Liu from Peoria. Um, my question is the Terminator question. So Stephen Hawking has warned us against artificial intelligence grown on check. And the type of artificial intelligence we're talking about is basically an input-output system for cars. Exactly. But other um, companies have been exploring trying to get artificial intelligence to learn actively from others. Famously, the Twitter um, artificial intelligence that went online had to be taken down because it turned into a racist thug. Um, so could you please give a comment on the dangers of artificial intelligence and whether or not there should be limits to it? Yeah, you know, Elon Musk is also very famously against artificial intelligence, but is also propagating it at the same time in the same form. And, and I, th I think that, um, I think that is the question we need to, to answer, right? I mean, the Terminator question was, it was used for war. At some level, artificial intelligence emerged out of DARPA because it was also used for military industrial complex type work. And that's an obvious thing. We don't want our soldiers fighting on the front lines. There are many questions around this. I'm not exactly what you're asking, but the, when you started building Skynet, it was inevitable sometime that it became self-conscious, right? And at some level, the question that I'm asking, and I don't have an answer to, is similar, right? Is that we've got we, we're starting this thing because of the convenience it brings us, and we see the snippets a few feet ahead of us, but the inevitability of that without thinking about it fully is that it leads to many more such things that at some point, I do want a butler that can also mow my lawn and drive my car and fight the people that come and break into my house and you know can spy on the neighbor and all of those things. Yes, that would be cool. <laughs> what else can that do? Sorry, I think... We're out of time, so thank you again. Um, 